Welcome to the Badge and Beyond. Uh, with this week's episode, we're focusing on uh, a question we got during the week, which was, when did we know it was time to leave the police force? Mm-hmm. Now, Danny and I both left at different times for different reasons, uh, but we also have a lot of people coming to our office probably once a week, ex-cops or people looking to leave, asking for advice. So we thought this was a really good opportunity to... First of all, free up some of our time and say to you, hey, these are the mistakes not to make when you decide you want to leave the cops. Yeah. So, Danny, you left the cops in 2017. 17. What made you leave? Um, well, I think it was not a like a one thing. I think it was a culmination of, 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 of incidents and feelings over years. No, I could, mm. uh, look, truth be told, I probably thought about resigning once a month I mean, for, <laughs> for 17 years or so, but... Um, I think what happened was you can probably split it down to, number one, financial. Um, as you know, with that wonderful system they had mm. where you, if you're a leading senior constable and you've maxed out the level, if you then get promoted to sergeant, it takes you three years to catch up to your original salary. Yes. I don't know anywhere else in the world where you get promoted and lose money. Mm-hmm. Um, so that wonderful system took its toll on me. Uh, because at that time, a lot of things, so we had had another child, so cost of living, blah, blah, blah. And of course, when you become a sergeant, you're not doing much overtime anymore. Yes. Whereas before, I was doing a fair bit of overtime. And I obviously changed locations because of, I took my sergeant's spot at KMC and all that kind of stuff. So financially, it was starting to take its toll. Um, so I was looking at other options. And then, uh, you know, the secondary employment system for the police which I believe is still terrible. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you want to do something else on the side, you just, there's all this paperwork and monitoring and stupidity. And so it's like, it's almost not worth it. Mm. And then you get taxed a fair bit as well, obviously. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot there. So I'd say financial was one of the, one of the reasons. It was taking sun and take its toll. But the biggest thing for me was I, I was headhunted for a role. And... It was basically just an offer too good to refuse. Um, significant f- financial improvement <laughs> um, and significant everything improvement, to be honest. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, for me, like I said, it's a culmination of a lot of things. But I was really getting, um, I was really getting jack of um, just people, certain people, not the community, mm. the, the 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 brass, like the senior police. Um, and just the the hypocrisy of uh, of certain things, and yeah. you get to a point when you've been when you've been around long enough, and you just you just start calling things out as you mm. see them, you know, as you could appreciate. Um, you know, you're getting in trouble for things that others are just doing flippantly every single day, and it just becomes you know a, your boss wants to cover his ass, and it's just throwing you in the firing line for different things, and it just became yeah like why am I still doing this? Yeah. Uh, so it gets frustrating, and you see things that are wrong, and you know how to fix it, how to change it, and then but the powers that be above you don't want to do it, and then you've got to pay the consequences. Yeah. Mm. So, I, I suppose that kind of sums up um, <laughs> how it was for me. What about for you? Well, look, I want to go back to one thing. You told me a story about what, because we, we both know the commander you said it to, but you, he offered you, <laughs> to, yeah. He, oh, yeah. he made an offer to give you anything you wanted yeah. to stay. Yeah. Yeah, I... Um, when I finally decided that's it for me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go, when I got the offer um, from that you know, so offer of employment, I called my um, commander up. He was the second person I called and just said to him, look, I've, Monday I'll be resigning. And he's like, oh, mate, no, no. Like, you know, what can I do to make you sort of reconsider? And I mm. said, give me a one cent pay rise. One cent? One cent. Yep. And what he goes, say? oh, well, he goes, you know, I, I can't do that. It's not within my power. I go, well, you can't even give me one mm-hmm. cent pay rise while my staying. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the things that really kicks you in the ass over and over is if you're a good cop and you work hard and you're getting good results and you're doing good work in the community, you just never get given that. Like in the corporate world, you get a bonus. I remember guys talking to me about, you know, oh, their wife did this and they like, just because they met the KPIs, they got a bonus. They weren't even like doing this. I was yeah. getting these, you know, mad bonuses. I'm like, yeah. I can, people argue with me if there's overtime. Yeah. You know, like I remember being uh, acting inspector and getting a 
um, walking in at 6 a.m. and the Bulldogs had won and that meant there was like a semi-final coming up or something. And I had to put the operation together for Campsy and everything had to start that day. And everybody just looks at me and goes, oh, that's yours. Uh, so I started at 6 a.m. I finished at like 11.30 at night trying to do all this planning and get stuff because it takes days to yep. get these things in motion. And like, oh, well, you're an inspector, like acting inspector, so you don't get overtime for that. You don't get, you know, you, you didn't even get like a, like a thumbs up, good job. It was just like, that's yours, yep. run with it. You're like, yep. But, you know, I, it, ultimately I, I, don't know, I came in, I worked early on that shift and did all the rest of the things for that. You get no recognition. No. And the people that often do nothing or just complain the loudest get all the recognition. Yeah. Uh, yeah, look, for me, um, yeah, similar but different. Um, I still loved doing what I did. But at the inspector rank, um, there were a number of, thing, number of things that I liked and a number of things I hated. So I liked being able to be out and be in charge and lead the troops. Uh, but honestly, it gave me the horrors when like, we had a guy that they called the eternal flame because he never went out. <laughs> he just wouldn't leave the station, you know. Um, and then you'd see, you know, the troops would be, you know, I think I had a good reputation with the troops, but then I was, you know, getting shit on by the boss because, you know, I wasn't pulling the company line or doing whatever um, in that respect as much as they wanted. Um, you know, you're constantly under the microscope and Monday morning quarterback for shit that you did not know. Yeah. Like, you know, you're making a decision two, three, four o'clock in the morning when you've got two cars and no one else and no one wants to pay overtime and all the rest of this. And then information comes to light in the next shift that you didn't know, but you got told that you screwed it because they've got all the information 48 hours later. Um, but also... I was liaising with someone outside as a, you know, the corporate liaison. And I started to get, hear what was going on in the corporate world. I'm mm. divorced. I'm getting my kids moved pillar to post uh, between my wife and I, my ex-wife and I, while we're trying to work things out. And I'm like, you know, I can work from home and I can do this and I can earn virtually the same money. I don't have to work weekends and Christmas. What am I doing here? <coughs> so... There was, there was that and the politics that was involved. I mean, my commander, she didn't like me because she thought I was aligned with my previous commander who was her political rival, which I wasn't. Yeah. I didn't care about. But yeah. she was probably the worst commander I've ever seen in action, ever. And it was very hard to hide my um, contempt at her lack of leadership and capability. Yeah. Um, she would, like... People, used, people called her Skeletor for the, her personality and the way she... I remember her walking in... You've got to love the police. Uh, oh, the this, cops come up with some really hilarious... Weird, like, in fact, but when you watched her and her mannerisms, it was very true. Yeah. Um, and she had, like, no personal capabilities. I remember she walked in the office one day, she put the TV on and the commissioner was on there and he was talking about road trauma being a new focus... 20 minutes later, she's like, cannel operations, we need, ev that's, we're going after road, the road toll, we're doing this. I'm like, we need some beaches. Yep. Right? At this time, yeah. we're in Maroubra. Yeah. We don't have the major road, we don't have like the Princess Highway, the M5, the M4, any of that kind of stuff going on. What? Like, we haven't had a fatal accident in years. <laughs> you know, like we just, but you want to focus on this because you're trying to tick a box to move to your next Point, yeah. When we needed to do right, the right thing and follow up on the crime that was an issue in our area. But that was her focus. Um, I, you, this woman would come into the office and she'd look you up and down. You know when you talk to someone, you talk to them in the eye and she'd look you up and down. And I remember the first time I was like, is there something wrong with my uniform? I'm checking to make sure my zip's done up because I'm worried that there's something going on. Yeah. And then I noticed she did it to everybody and I found her really hard to communicate with. And there was this guy that was in the office who would become an inspector about the same time as me. And he lost my respect for the very next thing that I'm going to say. And that was, 
I said to him, like, mate, do you find it hard to talk to the commander? Because I'm I struggle and I can talk to most people. He's like, yeah, I used to, but I realised she just likes it when I talk shit about people. So I just get in there every time I talk to her, I talk to her and complain about people and how crap they wow. are. Wow. And she was ringing him at the end of his shift, and he lived on the south coast. For three quarters of the drive, every shift, he was talking to her and just yeah. putting crap on people. Yeah. I'm like, okay, so you're putting crap on the troops. You're putting crap on me, putting crap on every other inspector. And she's loving it. Yeah, yeah. And she relates to that. Yeah. And I'm not that guy, no. right? If you do the wrong thing, yeah, you should get spanked and learn your lesson and come, up, come back. But most of the time, people just didn't understand what was required or they were under the pump or something. someone dropped the ball, but... Well, there is a team. Work with that person. Let me fix that and move on. Yep. Not her. And I was like, and then I realised I was being undermined by her and a lackey because they thought I was a political rival when I, I wasn't. And so then when it comes to it, I'm like, what am I doing? I'm yeah. late 30s, night shift gets really hard. I'm not seeing my kids as much as I want to. And my responsibilities of father outweigh my responsibilities to the cops yep. and to the community that I've served as a company man for um, nearly a couple of decades. So, yeah, it was time to get out. And um, the police, policing is a big part of your cult the culture and who you are, your identity. Um, so I think it's important to recognise for cops when you're leaving that you're going to feel there's, a, there's an emptiness there, like there's a change in who you are. Um, and try, you're trying to find yourself again when you leave. Yes, yeah, so it's funny. I heard a lot, and there was a saying I said to, to someone yesterday, there's nothing more X than an X cop, mm. right? And um, one of the senior officers when I was very junior, when, like um, kind of my mentor at the time, uh, her husband had just resigned, as a, and he was a police officer for many, many, many years. And I remember her telling me a story that I said, oh, does he, does he miss it? She goes, he doesn't talk about it. She said, but once, you know, we were at the shopping centre and two, two uniform officers were just going up the escalator as he was going down. She goes, and I saw a tear sort of, you know, develop in his eye. And I was thinking to myself, I wonder if I'll be like that. No, mm. no, no. Um, and I feel like for me, because I get asked that a lot, as I'm sure mm. you do, oh, do you regret or do you miss? I definitely don't regret. Uh, that's like a billion percent. Uh, maybe I regret not doing it sooner, possibly. Um, do I miss? What I miss are moments. Yeah. Right? I miss certain moments. Uh, and they're all centred around camaraderie. Yes. Or something where you, there's a lot of impact to the community. But in terms of the institution, I mean, I've had dreams where I've been told, would you come back if we promote you twice? Like, and I said no. Mm. Right? Um, I think for me... I don't have this thing where uh, oh, I really miss doing this, miss doing that. I don't. I'm grateful for the experiences and skills that I develop and the networks. Mm. Um, so I don't have regrets in that in that capacity. But in terms of missing it, no. And because I knew it was time for me to go. Yeah. Uh, and th and that's the thing. What what's another shitty thing about it is a lot of rumors then develop, and everybody likes yeah. you to be the bad guy. Yeah. Because they couldn't do what you've done. Mm. And I find very few, like with the exception now of this ODS where cops, are, you know, it's, it's a purely financial decision to get the hell out, right? And which was really funny because I don't know if you saw the premier the other day, they're talking about his greatest accomplishments so far. And one of them he said was recruitment of cops. Say so what? Yeah, yeah, you got to watch this. Are we, are we looking at the same numbers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. what's funny is completely disregarding the separations from the police force, and looking at, oh, we got all these new recruits. Yeah, because you're fucking paying them now. Like, yeah. at the end of the day, and, and you're and paying them money. And the quick, how do you pay them the money? Oh, you're using the budget from the cops you don't have and their salaries to be able to yeah. supplement yeah. So let's, let's lose... You idiots. Let's lose all the experience that there is in the, um, in the force. There are some, some great operators leaving now. Um, and we'll just recruit brand new people. Mm. On, from mm. what I believe, lesser standards than before. Yep, reduce standards. Yeah. And, so, yeah. so I don't know how we're... Interesting platform, but whatever. Good luck, Chris, <laughs> with that one. Never let the truth get in the way of a good publicity stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like, at the end of the day, um, what then happens is you've got this mass exodus of police. And as you said, we've 
we get a lot of inquiries from ex-cops about what they can do. Mm -hmm. So uh, in your experience, what have you seen? What, how, do, how do the cops actually feel about leaving? Where are they? What are their apprehensions? And what, what's life like yeah. you know, after the uniform? Uh, look, great point. I think what I've found for the guys that come in and talk to us is there's this element where they're looking for something that's similar. Yeah. Uh, they're looking for something that's fulfilling and they're completely lost. Not all the time, but often they're, they're lost because they, the cops, as you've said, are really good at telling you you can't be any more than being a cop. Um, and as I said, it's a big part of your identity. The mistakes I see people make is they walk out, they literally buy RPLs for 10 different things, yep. spend thousands of dollars with these companies that make a living out of selling you that you can be qualified to do all these and things. And the RPLs recognise prior learning yes. certificates for yeah. training you allegedly yes, right. satisfy. And it's all, it's amazing that, you know, these guys keep making money and they, they tell you, oh, you can have this and you can have that, but oh, you've got to spend four grand for this, three grand for yep. that, two grand for this and something else. And you'll be able to walk into all these jobs. Now, obviously, we interview for investigators and mm. I look at what things people have and I'm like, well, I can read between the lines of what you did. I don't ask people for their certificates as much as I ask them for their SAP profile of what they did in the cops when we're, when we're bringing on new staff. But people always tend to go for um, investigations and for security and stuff like this. But honestly, what I say to people is, just stop before you buy anything, before you do anything, and ask yourself, what's your default setting? What does your mind go to? What do you enjoy doing the most? What yep. do you think about the most when, you're not, when your mind's not occupied doing something else? Yep. And then use that as your basis on where to go next. Yep. I've seen people go into finance, broking, mortgage broking, sales and things like that. And I say, first of all, as a cop, I probably wasn't, you don't, as a cop, you have the reason to talk to people and they've got to listen to you to some extent. That doesn't mean you're a good salesperson, mm. right? And at the end of my time, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I was done. So unless you're a negotiator or someone like that, um, high-end sales stuff probably isn't there for you. But going and being a mortgage broker, that is constant face-to-face -face with people that were the people you either used to serve or people you used to lock up. It, it takes a lot out of you. And people see you on this dream of lots of money and easy money and small business. Small business is hard, mm -hmm. right? If you're going to back yourself and go into small business, you've got to be prepared to be able to supplement your income for four or five years at a minimum and have enough to do all your marketing, do the establishment, set yourself up and have a few months where you just don't earn any money. Yeah, I remember when we started, mate, there was a time, there was months we didn't pay ourselves because mm. we were just putting money into the business. Mm. Um, and so I think my big thing to people is don't buy a... go Find something that your heart's going to enjoy, but don't buy qualifications because you've got to be able to walk the talk, so to speak. You've got to know those individual parts. Like I see guys buying a WHS qualification. I'm like, okay, well, explain to me what that means. Yeah. Go onto a site and talk WHS with someone else that knows WHS and then tell me if you if you know WHS, if you can consult, if you can write the policy. Yeah, and I think what's important is these guys that run RTOs or registered training organisations, they're, they're marketing to you for a reason, right? Mm. Um, because they know there's this fear that, um, and not just police, a lot of government sort of um, organisations are the same. They institutionalise you to believe that you can't do anything else but that, mm. right? Or maybe you could jump into security, right? And, you know, the same as you, I, the conversations I'll have with these guys that are coming out is, like, what do you want to do? Yes. And some of them have, are in the process of leaving, which is good because they've still sort of got a bit of time, mm. where others have, for whatever reason, have left. And then it's like, I... Now what do I do? Or with this ODS, I've got a bit of money banked and hopefully I've got time to go, to go find something or I can invest yes. or, or whatever it is. I think the first thing is absolutely you're employable. Right? You're so employable. Mm. It's, it's a matter of looking at what those skills are. 
Now, the difference is with what we do at Precision when we're recruiting, we all, like the whole team has that skill set, right? Yeah. So we are recruiting specifically for certain areas. So it's not the same as like, oh, my next cops, I'll, I'll come on board. It, for us, it's not what we want, okay? Um, we're, we're interviewing for a particular defined background in high-end investigations, right? Because of all the services that we, we offer our clients. But whereas on the security front, Think about how excited you're going to be um, jumping from the police into the security mm-hmm. space. I mean, unless you're in executive senior management, right? And so there are only a few of those companies that have that sort of capabilities. Um, so then the, the money's good enough and you're coordinating and you're running and you're managing yes. stuff. I, I can't see too many cops getting job satisfaction standing in front of a club. No. Right? So there's a, a lot of that too. And security companies will want to show you off as, oh, my, God, my guys are ex-cops, this guy's an ex-cop. So they, they leverage off you. That works really well for the boss, mm. right? So unless you're the boss or working in his senior management, I don't know if that's the, the right grab. And, again, we've got a ridiculous system in New South Wales where you still have to go do the security course. You've been a cop, highly trained, uh, yeah. tactical prowess, shits on what the security course is, but I've got to do your stupid course. Yeah. Like, Really? Do you know that in all the countries I've travelled to in the world, they laugh at that? Mm-hmm. Like I sit with military and law enforcement and they're like, you have to do a course to do security yep. and that's what you used to do. And think about even the ridiculousness of someone who was in tactical operations. Like our version of SWAT had to do, has to do a security course. That's right. Like, really? They, they got a million dollars worth of training just to be a basic operator, Every the year. most junior guy <laughs> on the team before they can even walk out and be operational in that team. Yeah. And they need to go and do that training. Yeah, that's... Uh, it kills me. We, yeah, I don't know how, like, there needs to be a, a huge lobby for this stuff, but it makes no sense that that's the case. Mm. I find it r- ridiculous. So, I mean, I know p- the shortest bow to draw is security for, for cops, but I'd be like, really think about this space. Yes. Right? And again, I don't like. I know from cops that have done it, very few have stayed in it, and the ones that have stayed are not satisfied. They're not happy with, oh, with what they're doing. It's it's a definite step backwards. Yeah, it really is. And I, one of the best examples I ever heard of, and it's the the usual friend of a friend. But when I was looking at transitioning out, someone was talking to me about someone they knew, and uh, the husband of that couple was, I think he was, you know, someone in the military, like a major or a colonel, forgive me, I don't know army ranks very well. But he, he was looking at leaving and he got out and he's like, well, now what do I do? Yeah. And someone in the corporate world said to him, well, you were in infantry, right? You were a colonel, major, whatever. And he's like, yeah. And he said, well, so everything you do is about planning and moving all the, everything up and the strategy. And he's like, yes, so... Like, that sounds an awful lot like you would be amazing at logistics. Logistics, absolutely. And he's like, oh, I never thought about it. Mm. Went into a corporate space. I think last time I heard, they were saying he was, like, um, president of the logistics of an Australia-wide company. Yep. But, you know, to him, he was like, well, it doesn't have guns and it doesn't have men that I lead and, you know, we're not storming a battlefield kind of thing or, you know, a fortress, whatever you want to call it. But... It's tran- a transferable skill set. Yep. Um, you know, because you're in the cops, you're very good at managing frenetic situations. You're, you understand risk a lot better. You foresee, we were just talking off air about the ability you have in the police force, especially the longer you're in, to foresee that this equals that, which equals that, which equals that. You're kind of thinking five steps ahead and so as a manager, as a, someone that offers solutions, you're often that much further ahead because you're processing quicker. Yep. And that's why, and, and like you say about security, I can't think of anything worse than getting out of bed in the morning going to a job you hate. Yep. Um, and feeling like you've taken a step backwards. Yep. So if you're still in the cops and you're thinking about leaving, find that thing first that you want to do and make your planning and preparation for it. Yep. Yeah. You know, and also look at what the cops will give you to help you get out. You know, like I remember I did a course in the police force for XL, like XL, the, the spreadsheet yep. thing. And people were like, well, why would you do that? And back then I was doing it to help manage exhibits and things. 
But you know what? Spreadsheets are a great way of managing information. Yep. And if you understand and utilize that when you're running a small business or you're in business, it's just one thing that someone else doesn't have, but the cops will pay you to go do the course. Yeah, yeah. The soft so skills, it. 100%. Yeah. Very smart. Very smart. Little short certificate fours, you're training in assessment courses, yeah. all that kind of stuff, whatever you can get, go, go do it. Um, it's, it. You may not see it immediately, but it definitely fruits later on. Um, the cyber space, the oh. cyber security space is very different to mm-hmm. the normal security space or the traditional one we're talking about. Cyber security space is something that's going to be around for a long time. It's just going to keep going. So educating yourself in yes. that space will definitely help. Um, and I think... The other side of it, even to the employers out there, a lot of them um, don't also immediately understand what policing is. Absolutely. So you want to be able to um, present yourself in a way where you can actually show what the employer has to gain by having someone like you there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even with us with Precision, that's, that's one of our biggest strengths that I'm like, imagine detectives working for you. Yes. What could we do for you, right? Um, unparalleled research skills, unparalleled negotiating skills, unparalleled interviewing skills, all this kind of stuff. When you're sitting in a room, you know, on the right-hand side of the, of the CEO or the boss and, you know, watching a negotiation or a mediation happen, your insights are invaluable. Um, what you're picking up with the nonverbal cues, depending on what kind of cop you were and yep. um, what roles you did, those kind of things are very transferable skills. And even for myself personally, it took... Um, uh, a wonderful uh, sort of um, CEO and, and company owner to to see that, and he just said, "Just I just want you to sit in the meeting. Mm. He said, sit in the meeting and tell me what you think." You know, and he he did that with me, and I was like, it changed my confidence levels on, upon leaving. That's right. You know the the thing, and I was like, I had plenty of information to give him. I go, well, he did this, this, and this is what I think. This is what I feel, and he's like, spot on. That's exactly what this guy is. I'd never met the guy. Mm. Um, and you forget that, you know, especially depending on what kind of roles you did in the police force, you're looking at all these things in concert, you know, to, to, to form an opinion. Because your, your judgment is for survival. Yes. You know, it's not about, oh, I'm, I'm sort of make I just want to critique someone. This is, you're weighing something, you're making little risk assessments in your brain at the same time so quickly that can be used definitely in the corporate 100%. space. You, you have a, uh, excuse the French, but a bullshit meter. Yeah. Right? And... You know, like your sixth sense is really heightened when you're in the cops. You, you're so used to people lying to you, almost know it straight away. Yep. And you notice things that other people don't notice. Yep. Um, and people are the constant. When we're doing our work, no matter if it's in the security consulting space or investigations, you're always dealing with people. Yep. Um, and whether that's from a... You have to learn that corporate speak. You have to learn how to relate to people in business. But I think what you, you just said there is a great example of some of the things you do. Go spend some of your days off or whatnot. Find someone that might want to mentor you that's not going to be a competitor. Yep. Don't do what we had someone come into our office and say, oh, I want to go into business uh, doing the same thing as you in competition. Um, tell me all the things I need to know. And I was like... <laughs> Yeah, see you later. Yeah, yeah. And, Thanks for and that. We've had more uh, than one of those. Like, yeah. I, I, you know, there's just those points like, yeah. I don't know where you thought that I was going to give you a leg up to compete against me, yeah. but that's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, but go to someone who's not going to be a future competitor or who might be able to use your skills and say, I will volunteer my time. I just need to learn. Right? The other thing I want to say is don't – it's very hard for police to turn off the – um, hierarchy system where mm. they think, oh no, now I'm starting at the bottom again and it's going to take me all these years to get to whatever. Supermarkets, right? Yes. Woolies, Coles, they've got very good sort of progression programs for management. And let me tell you, they shit on the cops for salary, mm. right? Um, what uh, deputy managers and managers that are doing at a senior level on, on some of these metro stores are uh, getting more than your, um, your senior management team, right? And they're much younger than you. Okay. But, but I think the key to remember too is when you go to the corporate world, is yep. you're that guy in the cops or girl who like goes to work and does the minimum oh, yeah. and just wants to get paid, forget about that. No. Right? Like when you're on a salary, there's an expectation. 38 hours is like a good week. That's the minimum. Yep. You're on a salary. You know, I know there's lots of people we deal with. I mean, you and I work Saturdays, Sundays, whatever, constantly, but that's running our own business. But on a salary... 
there are people that do seven day weeks, six and a half days at a minimum. Yep. Um, and they're sometimes doing 12, 14 hour days. They live in the office. Yep. So make sure you know what you're getting yourself into. Yep. Uh, one other thing I, it just came to me as we we're talking about that is your interviewing skills. Mm. When, when you're going, going for a job, the thing that we always saw when we interview for people on, uh, and we do panel interviews where there's usually three of us, um, I see someone and they use the same incident all the time as evidence of their capabilities and characteristics. But they always try to pick this big traumatic event. I've seen guys that were detectives talking about, oh, I went to this car accident and then I did this and then I did that. And I'm like, okay, so that's that. But now talk to me about something where you've done this. Well, in that same incident, I did this and I did that. I'm like, wait, you're not a cop anymore. Unless you're going for a frontline service, look at something that's a bit more strategic that yep. focuses on yep. what that company needs from you. So when did you manage a HR issue? When did you notice that the reputation of the organisation was in danger and something needed to be done? And how did you manage that? How did you save money or increase the value proposition for um, a potential stakeholder or client? Because that's what you need to be looking at now because you're not a frontline service. Yep. I mean, it's amazing that you can do uh, all these different things that we did in the cops, but that's not the job you're applying for. Yep. Yep. And the other thing is to like um, empathy. You need to put yourself on the other side of the table. So it's not about, don't be so pigeonholed and this is who I am, this is what I've done. What do you think the other person on the other side wants? What are they looking for? Yes. Right? Because um, I know for us, we go into an interview and we know what kind of person we want for that particular role. Mm. Um, so your initial paperwork and your cover letter and all that stuff, that just gets you that you're at least qualified to have this conversation. Yes. Right? But the interview process use those int intuitive skills because you're going to be looking at the other side and seeing what they're responding to and what they're not. And especially with non-government work, where because government works usually, here's the template, they ring in three people on the day, make sure they tick those buzzwords. Yes. And the cops are the same. Yep. That, that whole promotion system is so stupid. Right? Oh, he didn't mention that. Yeah, he did say this, corporate policy, this, whatever. Right? Whereas as a business owner, I'm so invested in what my staff yes. are. Right? So... It's not the same. So when you're going to, to small, medium business and you're talking to the head of HR or the, or, or the or if it's a smaller company, you're talking to the owners of the company, it's what they want, mm. right? It's not, it's not about, uh, it's really important. So then having those conversations in, you know, you know that, that bit where they say, Is it, do you have any questions for us? I mean, I'd ask the, the, the owner, what? What, what are your biggest challenges in this job? Yes. What are your biggest challenges in this role? Where do you see that I will need to make the most impact? I'm already talking to him like I've won the job, mm. right? And where do you see me fitting in on this so I can have that mindset on it? And it, Because you're going to be the one person that says it out of the 50. Yes. And I'll remember that as the, as the business owner. Do you know what I mean? It will set you apart. Doing the HR process yeah. is an expense. Mm. The time and the money that goes into advertising and recruiting, and then if you don't get it right, having to redo it, you want to come across as being not just the best candidate, but the candidate that's going to be there the longest, the candidate that's going to be the most flexible, adaptable. Everybody has their things that are like just the killer for the job. You know, like, oh, if it doesn't allow me to work from home on this day or, you know, it requires too much travel and things, then you'd be open about that. Yep. But understanding that it's give and take. Mm -hmm. You're not in a government role anymore if you're outside of a government role, if that makes yeah. sense. And what's funny is, especially with jobs where, um, like, like ours, when we recruit, we definitely do reference checks. Mm. Well, that's extremely important for us, all right? And we're talking to the people that are still in the job yes. that know what you're like. So that reputation is extremely important. So when you're, when you're the person that's like, oh, the popular guy, but mm. lazy as hell and delegates everything, I don't want you. Yeah. Yep. I don't want the blokey bloke that hangs out and it was cool and he's cool to work with. That means nothing for my business mm. because then I need what I need to, is your attention to detail, strong work ethic. I need to know you've got highly experienced. That's the that's the that's what I'm looking for. Nothing kills me more than reading through the applications when we go out to market for a new employee, and we say things like uh, you know, detail orientated. And all of a sudden, you get these cover letters that are addressed to someone else or a different. Yeah, you know, they've just cut and paste, sent it to you, and they've yeah. 
forgotten to put the job out. Like, yeah. no, you weren't detail orientated in what you did. Like, yeah. that's an automatic fail. Yeah. Um, so don't be sloppy and don't be lazy. Uh, because also remember too, your skill set, unfortunately, in the moment, with everybody leaving the cops, well, they'll find that in someone else that's willing to do a little bit more, that has done more, or is willing to take a little less. So consider your marketplace, where you're going and what you're doing. Yeah. You have a lot of good skills to offer outside of government, outside of frontline service, but also be realistic about what you have and what you don't have and who the market is, what the marketplace is like out there. Yeah. And funny, the thing you said about sales, again, I'd be, if there were officers out there that were really good handlers of sources, mm. um, you'd, be, you'd do very well in sales. Oh. Conversation management, if you're good at that, um, that's a BDM role, that's a, that's a sales role. Yes. That kind of stuff will definitely work for you. But you've got to have the network. Absolutely. But, so if you're looking yeah. at a role like that, you need to have the network to begin with. So you need to start to, and that's like a year, two years worth of work before that. Yeah. And that's what I think people miss. They come out cold and they're like, oh, go be a BDM. Like, okay, who do you, who's your first client? Or who do you think my first client should be? Yeah. Well, if you're a BDM, you're expected to come with a network or yeah. a capability. Yeah. So my, look, my absolute um, big advice for those that are leaving the cops to, to, you know, to, you know, to do something else, do your homework, man. Yeah. Investigate the opportunities. That's probably the best way I can put it. That's right. And if you've got two or three employers you want to work for, do your homework on them. And re- re-qualify. Yeah. I know someone that was an intel officer that is now unemployed looking for intel jobs and can't get one. And I say, well, if that's the case, you're going to have to re-qualify because there's only a handful of agencies that look for intelligence people. Yep. And if considering how many good intelligence people there are, if you're not getting the jobs that are going and they're rare as hen's teeth, time to re-qualify. Mm. Mm. So. And then, again, for the people that listen that are, that are business owners uh, and you've got staff vacancies in your organisation, mm. I would be like, consider, because very few people will consider what can, or what can an ex-cop bring to the equation or what so can much. an ex- ex-detective bring to the equation and they could bring a lot. Um, because number one, with all due respect, they're not chicken shits. Yeah, right? they're not going to. They're not going to fall over the first time yeah. you say that guy's a jerk. Yeah. Oh, an angry man came to the through the. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And that's what's funny because also for us in the beginning we're like, with us, one of the few staff members that we recruited that wasn't um, in law enforcement, just not knowing how to deal with conflict, even in an email, an aggressive email or or a phone call, which you and I would laugh at, um, and we laugh at most things, but, <laughs> but again. That desensitization against aggression, um, that's worth something. Because imagine that's your, that's your shop front person mm. who's not intimidated by some angry customer idiot that wants to put on a, put on a scene. Um, and that makes things much better for the whole workplace as well. You've got that, got that kind of person. Then you've got the discipline, mm-hmm. right? and they have, the, they have the understanding. Hopefully they hold themselves to a high standard. There's a level of integrity there. But they also know the evils of the world. Yes. Right? And it's intuitive. So they can sense like, hey, this is not good for business. This is not good for, for safety. All those kind of things, they're, 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 they're things you want to bottle. They're a, they're a born crisis manager, yeah. just break glass, yeah. really, because yeah. that's what they've been used to. Yeah. So anything you give them is generally not going to be that intimidating. Yeah. So if you can help them with the technical side of whatever workplace mm-hmm. you have, whatever it is, so if that's a course, so be it. If that's a bit of mentoring, so be it. But, you know, someone coming to you with, say, 10 years policing experience, yes. they've seen some shit, right? Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. And they, you know, the fact that they've survived and done what they've done, and especially if they've gone through to, you know, senior constable and above kind of ranks, they've also got managerial and supervisory experience. Mm-hmm. You know, these are things that are important. Um, but I think on the flip side of that, manage, management in, in police systems is very different to management in the corporate space to one at some extent. Um, but if, if you go, like we, as we saw with some of the officers that have gone to now work for NGOs and community organisations, you can't be ruthless, right? So don't manage the way you were managed in the cops. Mm. You know, you know the, where we used to laugh at warm and fuzzy, well, guess what? Um, you need to treat people like humans. And if you're, going to, if you're going to have that kind of very ruthless managerial style, you're not going to last. They'll no. get rid of you straight away. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. 
All right, well, I think that pretty much sums up the advice we normally give people. <laughs> I hope that's been helpful to you. If you have questions or questions or comments, please leave it on our socials or uh, you can even email it to us at uh, through the form on privateinvestigatorsydney.com.au. Uh, we're always happy to answer your questions and don't let this stop you if you're a police officer or a former police officer looking for opportunities or feeling a little bit lost. Always reach out, Danny and I, or any one of the team will probably be happy to discuss with you uh, some of the next best options for you and where to from here. So while we wrap up, Danny, who's our sponsors today? Well, can we give a special shout out to IC Technology uh, for all all things managed IT services? And you can find them at ictechnology.com.au. So for those businesses that need IT, that's where you go. Exactly right. I'll I'll vouch for them. They're pretty good. They always fix up my issues. (laughs) And as always... And there's plenty. (laughs) I haven't launched a laptop out a window for a while, thanks to them. Uh, And also uh, our own company, Precision Integrity, and you can find us at privateinvestigatorsydney.com.au. Thanks, guys. See See you next time. time.